Hi, I'm Carol Cottrell, and I had the honor of serving as mayor of the city of Saginaw from 2005 until 2007. In the year of 2007, Saginaw had the opportunity to celebrate its sesquicentennial, or 150th birthday. As a part of the celebration, we went back and interviewed former mayors who were still available to us to talk about what it was like to sit in the center chair at City Council and to give us their perspective on the events that took place and helped shape Saginaw to become the city it is today. We hope you enjoy the interviews and thank you for being a part of Saginaw's history, its rich heritage, and its promising future. I remember I hadn't even thought of running for mayor, even though I'd been on her a while. I, it, it didn't really come into my mind until the election the week before. And all of a sudden, uh, I was reminded that I was the oldest member in time of, a, of um, being in office. And, and the Saginaw News reporter asked me, are you going to run for mayor? And I thought, you know, maybe, I, maybe, it was a, maybe I'd like to do that. And uh, so I put some feelers out and uh, had some support. And finally, I needed one more vote, and I called one of the council members who said that uh, I would be that council member's choice, but uh, that I hadn't asked him yet for his support. So I called him and asked him, and uh, it ended up that uh, just prior to the city council meeting, probably quarter to six, that person called him and says, I'll vote for you, and that gave me the five votes that I needed. And then my family was all there. I felt good about that, and I... Uh, People have often asked me how I even got into it, and I'm way back when I first started becoming involved in the city. Uh, it was over an issue in our neighborhood, and I went out and got some signatures. It was for the speed limit on uh, State or on Davenport, right by Furbringer School, and a couple of cars had gone through the fence, not making that curve. And, and I said, we ought to try and get that speed limit lowered, and they said, we can't fight City Hall. And I said, well, why can't I? We'll give it a try. So I got about signature with about five, six hundred signatures on a, on a petition and brought it down to city council and I was shaking and I was nervous and then they always say well I went down there one day to fight city hall and about 10 years later I was city hall <laughs> so the the process is this you know the osmosis from being a scared uh, citizen of mayor took about 12 years but I enjoyed every minute of it and it, it gets in your blood and you think you can do something and I was always the kind of person that I always wanted to know what was going on and if you weren't in the inner workings, not that there are things going on behind the back, but just how it all happened. And I, I kind of cut my teeth on this first petition, and then I got on a couple of commissions. I was on the original Human Planning Commission, and we dealt with the block grants. And, and I just just, uh, just stemmed from that. And I just, as I got more involved, I learned more, got more confident with myself. Uh, took a Dale Carnegie class so I could speak in front of people. and. Uh, Finally got elected in 1985. I had been appointed to city council twice before that to fill vacancies. Ran for election and got beat, but uh, somehow I just didn't want to quit. After you get beat once, it was, what, by a very large margin, I thought, well, I'll give it one more try in 85, and then I won quite handily that time. Well, uh, I guess it never really changes. It's always uh, the, the financial st stability of the city, uh, what you can do, and uh, one of the uh, surprising things was um, I found out how unimportant really the, at times the city council in America can be because you depend almost wholly on, on state and federal grants. And if you don't have those, there's not much you can do. You can go out and buy some police cars and stuff and buy the salt for the roads in the winter, but to really plan and have a forward-looking plan for your community, you need those federal and state dollars, and that was always tough. The... Um, the first year I was mayor, we tried to raise the income tax, and it failed. Not by a lot, but enough people voted no that, that we knew they didn't like it. Well, then we tried it again, uh, Vernon Stoner, the city manager, then we got together, and uh, what can we do? So we, the city had uh, been partly lighted in mostly east side downtown, and we promised that if the people would raise the income tax, we had a specific list of things that we would do with that money. We were going to light the whole city. We were going to reopen the Mershon Pool. Uh, well, there's some other some as, some aesthetic things that, on the streets and on the sidewalks, repair repair sidewalk. And we said, if you give us this raise, we will do these things with that money. And 
I got the council members together, and uh, I can remember we, wa we walked door to door as council members. We, we gave up our pay for a month as a kind of a significance to get it started. It was about eight or nine hundred dollars, I guess. And, uh, but we spent many Saturdays and Sundays walking door to door as council members. And uh, I think people learned to trust us because we, we got right there at their home talking to them, told them what we were going to do. And I think that one-on-one -on -one contact, you know, let's say politics is local and, and people like it when they know and see the person and um, without sounding uh, any, any arrogance at all. I just People were impressed that the mayor was knocking on their door and asking them why, how they're going to vote, and if not, why not, and here's what we're going to do. And uh, um, I, thought, I felt like the guy from the home publishing, you know, I didn't have a handful of balloons. <laughs> <laughs> but when I knocked on the door, people go, the mayor's at the door, you know. And, and we, some people just said no, slammed the door in their face. Others wanted to listen to us. And that took about three months. And then uh, we got it passed. And we did those things. The only thing we couldn't do was, uh, was the pool at the Arthur Eddy School. There were some hiccups in that and some state regulations and, and the money just didn't allow for that. But everything else that we promised we would do, we did do with that money. And that's why we had the income tax, the three-quarter percent for non-residents and that kind of stuff. We did that. And that was probably the hardest thing we did. But we needed to. Something had to be done. Yeah. And people trust you. If, you. if you trust them, they'll trust you. Mm -hmm. yeah. People have a vision that uh, all of the council members are uh, professional, rich people. And uh, when they find out they're just a guy that lives down the street and I had to go to the I worked at Mount Warren Foundry, and I had to go to work at night, too, just like they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess they just trusted us a little more once they got to know us. Mm -hmm. so we, bothered, we took the time to come and talk to them, not just put it in the newspaper or on television. We actually went out and talked to them one-to-one -one on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. And the people liked that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't say that I would have voted differently on anything. Um, I just firmly believe you, you do what you think is right at the time. And if it doesn't turn out right, that doesn't mean you made a mistake. That just means that you tried your best and, and uh, nothing, everything doesn't always work the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we, we did some things uh, downtown with uh, how we rented the buildings out and, and, and property abatements we gave to uh, some of the businesses that folded up shortly after we gave them. But you don't know that. Right. You can't, you, you trust. I like to be trusted, so I trust people. And uh, some of the people we trusted uh, didn't live up to their promise. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's over with and done with, and we can't digress back into that. Yeah. City's having a tough time now with its finances, and, and a lot of those businesses have left the town. They, some of them lived up to their promise. You know, again, takes up tax abatements for 12 years. They stayed 12 years, and then they mm -hmm. folded their tent and moved other places. Mm -hmm. But all in all... Uh, there's some things I guess I could have voted differently, but I didn't know at the time. So I thought at the time I was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I always tried to be visible. Um, again, I go back to some of the people think that the council members and the mayor aren't, uh, they're somewhere up on a hill or in a big home somewhere in the suburbs or wherever. And they're rich and they got a lot of money and they make a lot of money when they're in council. But... Uh, I, went, I tried to go to a lot of places that I hadn't even been before. There, were, there are groups and social groups in this town on both sides of the river that I didn't even know existed. And if I got invited to their banquet, I tried to make that. I kept track, and I think the two years I was mayor, I was at over close to 300 events. You know, that's one every other day or so. Wow. And I still worked full-time at the foundry on third shift because so, I had a wife and four kids. But, uh, I had to make money and supply them with, with their food and <laughs> clothing and... Uh, but getting out, meeting the people, and then um, um, I wasn't afraid, maybe I'm a little bit of him, I wasn't afraid to get up in front of people and act silly or sing a song or be a part of a group that was kind of silly. People uh, still talk about when we opened the Anderson Water Slide and they asked Hurley Coleman, who was a recreation director at the time, is, we want you here at 10 o'clock in the morning and wear a suit. Well, I knew he meant swimming suit, but I didn't bring one. I wore a suit and tie, and he says, where's your suit? And I said, I got it on. He said, well, you got to go down the pool. I said, well, I said, go down the pool in my suit, and I did. And I, larger than I am now, and I had a flag on my stomach, and you could see that flag coming down. The front. <laughs> Paul Wendler and I, we were the first two people to go down the water slide. And a few years later, they had, um, um, I went to Japan, and uh, that picture of me going down the water slide in my 
It was a cotton summer suit, but uh, that was on the front page of the Tokushima Press or whatever. The, no kidding. Uh, mayor comes to town and here's some things. And then when the people went to Japan a couple of years ago, they had this big collage of pictures, and that, that picture made the collage. And so I guess for nothing else, I would be, able to be remembered for that. And, um, and then the night I got shot at at City Hall, that was a pretty har harrowing experience. I didn't, I didn't think that anybody disliked me that well. You always think that everybody likes you, and I know some people, well, you find out everybody doesn't like you or what you do. But um, there was a man came to City Council meeting angry over an issue and uh, started to get very vulgar, so I had an officer remove him from the city hall. And then uh, the whole place was buzzing, so we took, it took a 10 minute recess and uh, I was sitting in a chair in the center seat and Enid Davis, the city clerk, said, well, it's always after council, there's some things you have to sign because the council's passed in that night, so then the mayor's signature has to go on those things that are passed. And uh, Enid Davis was kind of bent over the table, but we were doing some of those things already and a bullet came through the window. Now, and uh, I got some pieces of shrapnel from the, at that time there were some wooden Venetian blinds on the windows. There were some uh, real heavy material curtains and then the glass and they, being follically challenged in the back, uh, some of those things went into my head and I hit the floor and uh, I rolled up against the wall. For some reason I knew it was a shot. I don't know how I did that, but I just knew it was a shot. And uh, I looked out underneath the table and there were people on the floor and. And I think it was uh, former Councilman Dankern, who at that time was on city council, and he was he was a sheriff deputy, so he had a he had a gun in his pocket or in his belt or somewhere, and he he said, "Dell, are you all right?" And I thought, "I don't know." There was a stinging in the back of my head, but I think I'm alive. I don't know if I'm dead because I've never been dead before, <laughs> so I don't know what being dead feels like. And then I uh, I got up and I heard voice, so I, then I knew I was okay, but just a little piece of that shrapnel and that would. In, it didn't get out over the news till a few minutes later, and so I called my wife and told her that I'm okay and that everybody's okay. Well, they hadn't even heard about it publicly yet. It had gone on the cable TV, but uh, the general public didn't know about it yet. Well, I know the next day there, there was a plate glass company there putting bulletproof glass in the window. It had to be replaced, so less. And I think that was one. Yeah, you know, take it out of the council, and it cost about $700 put bulletproof glass. So, those uh, windows behind the council, no, no, those are bulletproof glass. I never knew that. That's good to know. <laughs> so just, and, peep, and I'm kind of a tall guy, and and, uh, and somebody, somebody who thinks they know ballistics, I guess, said, had I been standing, I might have gotten shot. But I was, I was sitting down in a chair, and it went over my head. Wow. And Nina Davis, she's only about five foot tall, and she was leaning over the table. So it just went right over both of us and stuck in the ceiling. And uh, they found a the guy that night in one of the, establishments on Hamilton Street and uh, he spent some time in a, uh, uh, to have him declared publicly fit for trial and they found out that he wasn't so but he had spent a year in that place and uh, he got a year in jail but they called the uh, psychiatric exam time served and let him go put him on a tether and let him walk out in the streets but I saw him once after that and I kind of I wanted to go up and punch him, and I thought, no, that wouldn't do any good. So <laughs> I just, uh, I just avoided him and, and, and walked the other way. Well, then we, I had another one previously. Before I was mayor, uh, we'd had laid off some city people, and I lived over on Barnard Street, over by St. Helens Church. And uh, one of the neighbors down the street, he's one of the people who got laid off, and he was talking to his neighbor. And it was in the summertime, and he'd have a few uh, adult beverages, I guess, in the, over the grill. And he uh, was bemoaning the fact he got laid off. The neighbor decided that he was going to be a fun guy, and he called and said, threatened to bomb my house and kill my wife and children. And he went to prison for a couple of years. But uh, my wife at that time was a secretary at the FBI here in Saginaw, and she called her boss to see what could be done. And he said, well, he used a telephone. That makes it a federal offense. And about midnight, they busted into the guy's door and uh, took him off to jail, and he was gone for a couple of years. So those are exciting. Not 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 the most pleasant experiences, but you don't forget something. If somebody threatens your life, that's a, yeah. that's a, something you remember for a while. Wow. Then the other fun, you know, some of us fun stuff. I enjoyed going, meeting the people. Uh, a trip to Japan. We um, Tokushima had its hundredth year anniversary celebration, and uh, asked me to come as a mayor of the city to come to Saginaw. So we. We raised some private monies. My wife and I went to uh, Tokushima for 10 days and uh, 
We built a replica gazebo like the one we have on the west side. Where we, that was built, and when we got there, it was built. And we dedicated that gazebo at a park in the city of Tokushima, Japan. And uh, over there, they treated me because they had other sister cities from different places around the world, but Saginaw was the only one that sent their mayor, and their mayor over there is a really highly looked upon character. They they have some respect for their politicians over there. <laughs> and uh, so I was on his side all the time, all the time we were there. And uh, um, I was at a, went to a dinner, I'd taken a, a gift from Saginaw Valley State University that has a sister university over in Tokushima. And it was one of the uh, Frederick sculpts, a copy of one of the Frederick sculpts, sculptures. And uh, they came and got us and said, you stand here. And my wife was next to me. and. And we will announce you and uh, big double doors. And uh, all of a sudden, they came over the loudspeaker representing the United States of America, the mayor of Saginaw, Michigan, Delbert Schrem, his wife, Nancy. And I thought, holy cow, and this big doors opened, and there was about 600 people in the hospital applauded. And wow. little Japanese girls came up and gave my wife these big bundles of carnations, which is their national flower. And I thought, Del, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> You're a, you know, you're a metallurgist and you work third shift in the foundry in Saginaw, Michigan. And here you're representing the United States of America. And it was, got a little heady there for a while. Wow. And then uh, from then on, I sat with the mayor. And every time we went to a banquet, I was, everywhere the mayor went, I went. And uh, he had his entourage with him. And we went to the city hall and they rolled out the red carpet. And again, Nancy got flowers. And I walked up the red carpet with the mayor in the city hall. And it was a, a really a gratifying experience. Again, it, it, I, I had to think of. What are, you, what are you doing here, you third shift out here? <laughs> <laughs> I was at a luncheon, too, and I, there was one lady was there, and I asked her, uh, I guess you make the mistake that you think everybody who is not Asian speaks English, and they don't. <laughs> and there were some people from European countries and spoke very broken English. And one lady I sat next to the lunch, said, what is, I said, what is your connection here? And she said, my husband is a, is a Spanish ambassador to the government of Japan. So I Again, Dell, <laughs> you're some pretty heady company here, Dell, but it was fun. I tried to uh, make the best of it without losing it, but yeah. it, it, was, it was quite an experience. I think, and people, people who see this will, uh, the Anderson pool opening was, was kind, of, kind of fun. I, I felt like we really finally had something. Everybody had been complaining there wasn't anything to do, and, and uh, I remember we closed the old Anderson pool a couple of years before, and Frank Anderson was really upset. And we told him that, uh, well, you, we just couldn't afford the upkeep. And he said, well, I'm going to give you some money, and you're going to build another pool. And I said, thank you. And he handed me a check for a million dollars. Wow. Or told me he, he gave me a promissory note. And I, people say, well, why did you build a pool? I thought, well, get, no, Mr. Anderson, I don't want your million dollars. You know, how, how do you turn down a million dollars? And then uh, being there, he, we, he, wanted, he wanted to be the first one to go down. No, he, was, he was in his 90s then, and we couldn't figure a way to get him up there, oh. up the steps. Oh. But he wanted to go down. He was bound determined, and finally he couldn't do it. So he chose Paul Wendler as his stand-in and myself as a mayor. Did he wade in the pool? He went, he, I think he dipped his feet in the water yeah. in the, uh, where the pool, the sliding pool ended. He came over and dipped his feet in the water, and uh, he was just, uh, he was in tears. He saw the kids jump in, and he... He felt like he'd really given something, and he had. Yeah. You know, I think the, the history of Anderson Pool is not so good, but for a few years there, people really enjoyed it. They came from all over the area. School busloads that made it a field trip in the recreation departments to come in from St. Louis and Alma, Mount Pleasant, places yeah. like that. Uh, uh, the one winter, we, had, we said that we were going to close Hoyt Park because, it, because of budgetary restraints that flooding the pool and hiring a staff and opening the warming house. We just didn't have that much money. And uh, some of the, the uh, McDonald girls and the Doyle people that used to speed skate around Hoyt Park in the wintertime, they were national, world famous speed skaters. Uh, they raised the money, and we had a big ceremony, and they gave me as the mayor the money to open up Hoyt Park for another winter. And the sad fact was nobody came. Still nobody came. Wow. So people complained, well, I remember back in the 50s, we used to walk to Hoyt Park, and I did that. I lived on the on the west side, just a couple blocks from the courthouse, and we used to walk to Hoyt Park, and we'd go there Sunday mornings after church or in the evenings after school. But uh, kids are just doing different things today, so it's, I guess you've got to get in where they are and find out what they want. But like I say, even though we did get the money to open it, we staffed it, we flooded the thing, we groomed the hills for sleds, and 
Still nobody came. The friendship games have just started, and uh, I got involved in it because I had four children, and all four of my children at one time up till about the, oh, I don't know, 12th or 15th year or something, one of my children had participated in every friendship game that had occurred up to that time. And uh, that was a lot of fun, met a lot of nice people. Um, unfortunately, I'd like to say everything comes to an end. Uh, uh, it got to be that the uh, participation one wasn't as as uh, what it should be, and we expanded into the, trying to get other to Carlton and places, Milwaukee, trying to get kids in. And uh, uh, and I'll be open and honest, but um, I talked to one of the council members that I had gotten to know through from being on the council, and at one time was general chairman of Friendship Games. He said the last year that the people from the Sioux didn't come, it was because of the Karen King murders. They said, we're not sending our children down there. And the friendship games were over. They just couldn't see it. They get Channel 5 on their cable system up there, and the, the big thing about the Karen King murders, and uh, they said, no, we're not sending our kids down there anymore. They just felt it was unsafe. So that was that was a big thing. But again, the, the exchange on the money and stuff, it got to be cost prohibitive for them yeah. more than us. But, yeah. Well, their dollar's only worth about 60 cents or whatever it is here. Yeah. Although we did get some people, that's, uh, some hotels and restaurants for even par. You know, they did that and they knew just for the goodness of the games, they, they took sure. ex even exchange in money. But wow. that was, uh, uh, Karen King murders was a death blow to the friendship game. Uh, they were proud of me that... Uh, um, how do I say it? Um, I got to be mayor of my own hometown, yeah. and that was kind of it was kind of special to me and my family yeah. and my relatives. I have some aunts and uncles that uh, they they tell their friends that's my nephew, you know, and uh, he's a mayor. My aunt sent me a letter and showed uh, oh some paper clip some newspaper clippings out of the, out of the turn of the 20th century where my, my great grandfather won a he won a buggy because he, he uh, contracted to build parts of the dike system in a prairie farm, and whoever got their dike built first got a real fancy buggy from the from the county or whoever. My my great grandfather who owned a brewery, <laughs> Shrems are always involved in breweries. <laughs> that doesn't tell me, I think. but uh, he won a fancy buggy, and uh, so there's a little historical stuff there too. Being our parent, our family being involved in what was going on, Saginaw, Saginaw County. I have a son that's a policeman, uh, 15 years almost, and he's uh, he uh, he likes his job. He uh, he said that's what he wanted to be, and there was some, oh, you know, there was some uh, flap over that about I wasn't the mayor anymore, but I was still on council, and yeah, you know, your son gets a job, and my son can't get a job, and and uh, I I at the time I went to the city manager and a police chief, but I said my son's applying for a job, if he's qualified, hire him. If he's not qualified, don't hire him, but don't. Don't not hire him because he's my son. That's not fair to him. Yeah. And they said, no, they weren't. And the, some of the media investigated to make sure that it was all on the up and up. But I can't tell how many people would ask me in the summertime, can I get their kid a job oh. cutting grass or in the rec department or umpiring baseball? Can you get my kid a job? Um, and if I could, I did. You know, I'd just say, turn in your name, and I'd say so-and-so. And I can't say I ever got somebody a job, but I told them how to do it. But uh, that was okay. If I got their kid a job, it was okay. But if my son got a job, well, then that wasn't the right thing to do. Yeah. I did the same thing the first year the pool opened. Uh, Hurley Coleman, the work director, I saw him a few days before, and I said, how's it going, Hurley? Getting ready? He says, yeah, but we still got a, we don't have anybody to sell tickets out front. And I said, how old do they have to be? He said, 14. And my daughter was 15. And I said, well, my daughter's looking for a job. He said, send her over. So she got a job being the first ticket seller at Anderson Water Park. But again, we took some, some people were angry at that, that the, the mayor, I was mayor then, and the, oh. the mayor's daughter got a job at the water park, but my kids can't get a job. But so, you know, some of that gets a little old. But uh, there's always those people out there that are negative and cynical. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think they made a mistake when they went to uh, earlier council meetings at 6:30 instead of 7:30 or whatever it is now, and. Uh, that that count, committee of the whole and the break and maybe running for
for a quick dinner or a sandwich somewhere. And, so, you know, sometimes we had more time than others, depending on where we went. But, like I said, we weren't full-time government employees, and we had our own jobs and, and things, family obligations. And we didn't always get together. And sometimes we call each other on the phone. But, and uh, it wasn't a meeting between the meetings that, uh, where we made decisions, but we could ask the city manager uh, or he would give us his opinion and why uh, the, the council of meeting, the city of committee, the whole meeting wasn't enough time. Mm -hmm. And it was just a kind of a casual conversation and, and uh, we didn't hide from anybody, we didn't go somewhere, everybody knew where we were gonna go and if they wanted to come and stand there and watch us eat, they could. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think for the little bit of money that saved, well, it's, uh, I say a little bit of money, Twelve or fifteen thousand dollars, whatever. That sounds like a lot of money, I guess. Um, to stop that and go to every other, other every other week meetings, um, I think you can lose track. And like I say again, with the council members not being full-time employees, they're not at city hall every day. You you go two weeks and not even talk to another council member, and you need to do that. And uh, sure, you can call them up or you can email them, but it's not being it's not the same as having that that face-to-face. -face relationship mm -hmm. I, I I liked it later and I liked it having it every week yeah. the money oh I don't like to say fifteen thousand dollars sounds like a lot of money to some people and, and it's a way to save fifteen thousand dollars and it's a but is it worth it I, I know you don't go uh, you don't go to co conventions anymore you're they're not real at SAG they're not real active in the Michigan Missile League and I tried to get us active in that when I was marrying before and after and uh, there are battles being fought in Lansing and in Washington and uh, sometimes those battles are won, sometimes those battles are lost. But if the battle is won, when it comes time to it delegating the spoils of your victory, uh, Saginaw, Michigan says, well, we'd like, uh, you know, X number of dollars for this project. And they're going to say, well, Saginaw, Michigan wasn't even there. So Saginaw, Michigan doesn't get their share. It might not be the way you like it, but that's the way the system yeah. is. The political games that you have to play in Lansing and Washington are real. Mm -hmm. And you have to be part of that. And if you're not part of that, you're not going to gain. Because like I said before, you depend totally on federal and state funds to operate. Yeah. And if you're not there at the council hearing or at the state level at the hearings and you don't get up and say your piece and say, I represent the city of Saginaw and the uh, Michigan Municipal League is fighting for that. And here's a list of cities that uh, have uh, expressed their opinion and Saginaw not on that list. Well, then when it comes to getting time to getting the, uh, the grants or whatever you want, uh, Saginaw's if there's money left over, you might get some. But if you're not there fighting the fight, uh, yeah. I think to the victor go the spoils. Yeah. And you've got to be part of that. Yeah. Well, when that was established, that was in the birth of block grants. And that was our main focus was to try to get, have meetings. It was divided up into school districts. Now, a lot of schools have been closed. But I think at that time, there were 22 or 23 mm -hmm. public schools. Mm -hmm. So every school district had a had, had a representative and I volunteered to be on that. And we had quite a bit to say about where black grants went. But then kind of the enthusiasm and over the years, um, people would uh, fight and argue for their programs and sometimes they get them, sometimes they didn't. You know, it was limited numbers and it, you know how that goes even yet. But it seems to me that then that the uh, Human Planning Commission had more integrity, not as the individuals, but the ideas of the Human Planning Commission carried some weight. Mm -hmm. uh, council not rubber stamped it, but uh, took into account the t time we spent to, and to iron the things that we gave them a report. Yeah. And uh, pretty well stuck. Not every time, everything we wanted, but sure. uh, they were just a little more, uh, uh, they, they knew that we had done our work and they trusted us to make those recommendations. Yeah. I don't see that so much toward the end of my career. And yeah. Oh, well, I, uh, I retired 11 years ago, so living the La Vida Loca, they call it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I just, I, uh, I, I didn't make any plans to move to Arizona or Florida or anything. My wife and I, we, we, that was, we never sat down and said, gee, when we, when we get, out of here, you know, when she quit working, I quit working, uh, what are we going to do? We never, we never made plans to leave. It was only through uh, some, uh, it, when I finally did leave the city limits, it was, uh, 
it was kind of tough. It was a hard decision to make, but uh, one that I thought was right for my family and myself. Uh, you know, children. I have four children. Three of them are gone. That I mean they're alive, but they're not in SAG anymore. Right. My one son that's still here. He uh, he uh, moved outside the city limits, and uh, we had some family issues with it, with special needs granddaughter. And I thought I'd like to be closer to them and to her. Sure. Not that I have to have her every day right. or be with her, but I want to be available to them. Yeah. And, uh, when we told him we were going to move close to them, uh, my son kind of backed off, and I said, no, it's not going to be like uh, everybody loves Raymond. I'm not living, moving across the street. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm moving in the near area, but I'm not moving across the street. I won't be at your front door every day. But He said, okay. <laughs>